Hey everyone, I'm Jason from Trading Games. And I'm Chris. And I want to start out tonight with a shout out to Phil at the Retro Gamers Community Hub. Basically, what Phil is doing is he is starting and launching his own YouTube channel. And he asked us to give him a shout out and say, you know, good luck and, you know, and congratulations on getting the channel going. He has a great community. I think he has over 40 like channels on wow. Facebook of just like collector stuff and, and it's amazing. He came down and visited the store a couple years ago, okay. gave him a collection tour. He was an awesome guest. And um, But I know he's gonna launch the channel with some really great interviews. Um, Walter Day, Howard awesome. Scott Warshaw, um, John Hancock, yeah, and, and a whole bunch of other amazing collectors. So good luck, good luck and uh, definitely go support his channel. I know nothing's launched yet. He has about 75 subscribers at the time of us recording this, but I know it's going to jump by thousands so quick. So give him a shout out whenever you can. Speaking of jumping by thousands, a um, couple things. We are so close to 3,000 subscribers. So I think, what did you say? We're about 25 subscribers yep. away from getting to that 3,000 number. Um, so, you know, if you like our videos, share them with your friends. It, it really helps. You know, we're finding new people or finding the channel all the time. Um, you know, one of the points of the video today, we just kind of started combing through videos. At this point, we've been putting out videos pretty regularly for about six months as far as this format, right? Yeah. The Train yeah. Games YouTube's been putting out videos forever. Yeah. Um, but for about six months now, so sometimes you forget, like, oh, there's a six-month-old video and people are finding it now. So there's new and new comments, and we wanted to go through that. Um, so we just thought it would be cool to do a little bit of a community discussion today. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do as we're giving some shout outs out, uh, if you do like our kind of content too, I just wanted to shout out a couple people that I also watch, you know, something I love, we're always willing to learn and everyone's kind of growing in this community together. You know, I'm fortunate enough I get to learn from Jason all the time, um, but I still spend a lot of time like looking at other sources and just listening to other talking heads and so on and so forth. Um, so just a couple shout outs to some people that I really enjoy watching. Um, uh, get the Greg Games, obviously most of you are watching our content, you've probably watched some of his, but if not, you know, help that guy out. Uh, the video game collector's podcast not to be confused with i'm gonna say you guys wrong i'm sorry There's video so game collecting podcast great guys uh good content really really knowledgeable i've learned a lot from josh and matt and dan and they're all wonderful people so check both of those channels out um i also watch a lot of pat you know the nes punk i do really like the cu podcast and i've just been watching it pretty regularly for years now i could go into tons of other channels but those are pretty comparable to some of the type of information that we talk to and i just thought it'd be cool to give a little bit of shout out to some people we also love our retro mikeys and our retro tonys and a lot of our local youtube customers i feel really bad we have a uh, thrift store youtuber that i really like and i can't think of his channel off the top of my head but he i'll try to fun, he does, he does some, some cool stuff, stuff. Yeah. he's done some cool videos of inside the store he's found mm -hmm. some good things and maybe in the comments i'll make sure i like give him a shout out in there too because i'm blanking on it right now so that, that's kind of like uh well today you know we're just gonna we, we'll touch just for a minute on some stuff but uh, we're just, we went through the comments and we do answer a lot in the comments as they come in but uh you know we just pulled some stuff and maybe we can address some people directly and maybe talk you know we just did some notes but you know how me and me and chris are we can just talk but uh we we have something really big we want to reveal about the relationship that we have <laughs> and it was one of the comments one of the one of the, the top comments and uh, uh chris took this one uh, kind of personally i think yeah he brought it up. so uh, uh this is from steve newsom i really enjoy your videos you guys have some chemistry that really works. Just a wild question. Are you father and son? Keep up the awesome content and game on. We are not. We do have very similar hairlines. Yes. <laughs> That's about it. Uh, I don't get as tan as him, but I do get fairly tan fairly quickly when the summertime comes. I just only live in a box now and just spend all my time in front of a monitor. <laughs> so I don't get tans yeah. anymore. I get tan really easy, so I'm out, and I'm outside a lot on my one day off. I played putt-putt a week or two ago. I've been trying to get out a little bit more. Exactly. It's almost like we had a global pandemic or something that kept us inside. <laughs> yeah, know? so we have, we have a yeah. sense of humor when we hear things like that. We appreciate we, we all the comments and somebody who always the price is always right always right great commenter on all of our videos bob barker bob this is out to you bob you make sure that you comment on every every video. single video we and really do actually appreciate it yeah you know what i mean we 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 love you yeah so very much so 
But other than that, we actually have some, you know, kind of serious uh, things that we want to kind of talk about. Nothing serious, actually, in, in our on our channel. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll just start with one. Um, so, you know, we're going to drop some names and stuff, and anybody can find these comments. But uh, I actually bookmarked this was in the supply and demand video. So, Anthony, uh, he said... Um, He's really recently noticed that local game stores are placing common games behind the glass. Uh, they would normally just be placed on the shelves. Uh, they haven't been getting any uh, new games uh, to move. They place just the same stuff all week around. As a collector, the thrill of game hunting has really diminished. Um, I'm happy people can make money, but it's getting a little much. It's not stopping them, though. It's just getting less excited for it. Well, that's what he said. Well, here's, let me just kind of like, it, we do see that. We hear about that happening a lot. It's something we fight for every single day at Trading Games is to get new exciting inventory in. And as a store that's been around as long as we have, we, like uh, what, what's happening I see with a lot of stores is they don't adapt how they buy. Um, they're not willing to take as much risk because they don't have experience. Um, so we know how to adapt and uh, pay more to, to sell it, still give the people a fair offer and sell at a fair price. We know our margins and we know how to buy stores that are not willing to adapt. We, we've seen that over the years. They, they don't last and then they don't have a new selection. Of course, they're, they're trying to stay in business, so keep trying to patronize them and trying to, to give them business, do some trades with them if you have some, a chance, if they have something in that will help them make some more money. But yeah, it's, it is drying up in a lot of stores. We're lucky, we, we're, we're smart, we're, we're educated, we know how to buy better and sell better be, just because of experience being here nearly 20 years. Um, so yeah, that I mean that we see that and hear that a lot. So you're not alone. Yeah, you know I spend a lot of time hunting myself, uh, a lot less than I used to, um, and it is very different when I do it. Oh, well, I am also looking for different things now, um, but it has changed. Um, there used to be a lot more stores to go to. There, Every there state. was a yeah. lot more stores and to now go to now, now. and unfortunately, a lot of the stores in my area that aren't here don't operate on regular business hours. So yeah. there's stores I would actually like to go to that yeah. I still have never gone to because they don't have working telephones and they don't have, uh, I'm not trying to talk smack, it's just the reality. There's one store that's an hour and a half from my house and they just kind of show up whenever. And so I don't want to make a three hour round trip drive and get there and not yeah. be able to buy a game. So I just don't make the trip, you know? Um, here's a comment that I pulled earlier that I found really, really interesting. This is from Old School. Um, he said, the fact that the new stuff is super hard or impossible to get has caused a lot of the price increases. Um, things like a PS5 and an Xbox Series X or the graphics card for your PC, no matter what brand it is, uh, has pushed all of us into, and I quote, the video game apocalypse. People are trying to get literally anything that they can and hold on to it tight because if they sell this old stuff high now, they'll have to buy the new stuff even higher. I don't see it coming to an end until there's something done about eBay. Um, I don't really correlate too much of that to eBay personally, but I, I do really like this comment. I something that has maybe we'd like to touch on more in depth down the road, um, but just to gloss over really quick. It, it's not something I really put a lot of thought into until I read this about how much like the scalping and things like that of modern era games are affecting retro prices. Um, are there, Do they have a direct correlation? I'm not 100% sure about that, but I do I can definitely see how they are correlated um, just on consumer purchasing habits and the way that people think. Um, and, uh, you know, I have touched on this in a video in the past, how I thought that the fact that PS5 new prices are $70 out the gate for a game and you're looking at like 78 bucks to buy a FIFA 22 um, makes it to where people are more comfortable spending 50 plus dollars on any retro game because it's still cheaper than a current game. So, I don't know, I just thought it was a really interesting comment and I, I think about it a fair amount now. So, thank you for that. Um... All right, uh, so Jordan said this one. I'm not sure which video he set, set it in, but eventually collecting will be a commodity for the rich. Um, so, and kind of my reply to that is, uh, stop and think about what's really selling for the high prices. Sealed, graded stuff, and some really, really rare games are always gonna sell for high prices. But, you know, as a collector, there's so many ways you can get into this hobby. You can start with just loose cartridges, loose disc if you want to start that way. If you're, if you're collecting on the new generation consoles, you can just wait till they become used. They all will. You don't have to go out and buy them the week they come out. Um, you can wait till the next season comes out on a sports game and get it for under 10 bucks. 
Uh, you could buy a cartridge with maybe a little label damage that still works perfectly. Uh, maybe that'd just be a placeholder. You know, there's lots of ways yeah. to really get in this hobby where it's not going to really be for the rich. The, the rich, these people paying fifty thousand dollars for a game, they're more like investors. They're not, I wouldn't. They're collectors, but they're investing. Well, you know, a, a good catalyst on that, uh, another person had asked uh, Matthew Nimno and said, lastly, for new collectors like myself, is it best to get whatever condition game you can find for starters and just upgrade your game down the road as you find a better version? For example, I started off with being happy just to complete a cart-only collection, but then I started to find myself like finding CIB games at decent prices, so now it's hard to just be satisfied with cart-only collection. Um, I think the biggest takeaway is when you start collecting, you really don't ever stop. Um, the bug gets you. Yeah, you just you, you just keep going, um, especially if you're gonna start cart only, because then you you're gonna do exactly what you like. The, what you just described is very very common in this hobby, um, and in a lot of other different hobbies. Like me personally, um, I've never been someone that's always sought the nicest of the nicest of the nicest. We talk about this a lot of the yeah. way that we grade games. I'm very title oriented, and Jason is a lot more condition, condition oriented. So like. I don't care if it's an eight, if it's a Mario, you know? Um, that's just how I've always been. Uh, I chase titles more than anything else. And I, I, you know, that's just my personal preference. I mostly like when I buy a physical copy of a game, I just like having something that physically represents it. The nicer, the better, but I, I have definitely made, you know, I own a molding Mega Man, okay? <laughs> like, I've, I've never passed on a game that I didn't own when it was reasonably priced. If I, if I knew it would just be a placeholder, I have some games I've never been able to find a better one. Yeah. I've found other ones that have been much nicer, and I sell sell and use it as trade bait to get the next game, from the, just yeah. to build the collection. So it just goes from there. You know, so yeah, I mean, and it's just... I also think your collecting habits will evolve over time because you set different goals for yourself and things like that. And I, I guess that's the best advice. Like stick to a goal that you're comfortable with and what you want. You know, there's no right or wrong way to collect. Um, you'll have lots of YouTube talking heads, ourselves included. Mm -hmm. um, it, try not to let what other people say you should have influence your decision on what you should have. It, it's what you but like. There's plenty of the game you're looking for out there too. You do not have to buy it the first time you see it. Um, I mean, support your stores if you can, but you know, if they're overpriced and not fair, don't, you know, you, there's always other ways to get it. And, um, you know, so don't speed collect just because you see it. You will end up paying too much usually. Um, another question someone asked is what drives the more expensive games on each platform to say the top five? Um, I think the answer to that is just clearly Metal Jesus Rocks. That's it. Yep. <laughs> Next. All right. Uh, France. Uh, Franz. Um, he, uh, and he's from overseas. So basically, he's in Sweden. So he said, uh, he's uh, interested to hear your thoughts. In Sweden, retail stores are basically a dead business. Um, he, he's guessing it's five to ten physical stores nationwide um, in all of Sweden. I don't know, unfortunately, how big Sweden is compared to certain areas of the United States, but I'm sure it's pretty dang big. Um, so my reply to that is, you know, here's some facts you might not know, but, um, and, and not facts, just what I, estimates. So five years ago, there, there was a thousand independent retail game stores, at least in the United States, not counting GameStop because they had over two, 3,000 alone, like many in each city. Um, but the, they're the modern stuff. But independent game stores, mom and pops, flea market booths, we're gonna talk about, that is also included, full-time flea market booths and stuff. Um, we heard of some people using some programs to do pricing. You know, they had five, six hundred people subscribe to their price list to help them sell games. You know, alone. And uh, now, um, especially after this pandemic, there's probably less than five hundred independent stores in the United States, and um, and that's counting some kind of big national franchises that have, you know, a hundred stores, 120, 130 stores. So it's really it's really gone down. Um, I think our future is solid. Uh, I do too. We, we, are, we are collectors and we, we have a good retail mind sense and we've been here a long time. So we have like three generations of customers now and that really, really helps with getting stuff back in and, and 
earning new customers that are aging into us, you know, from previous customers, we'll see them steady for a couple years and they'll go away for five years because they're having kids and then their kids grow into it. Uh, so that, that is something that's helped with, with our success, just time, you know, and making it through that over those hurdles. Yeah, I mean, the market's definitely changing and I, this is going to be different to every person that you talk to. I imagine if you opened up a store at the beginning of 2020, you think video games is a money printing machine, you know what I mean? Uh, I usually always you know, wonder if people have like a five-year plan on what happens if you're not getting inventory in and like all the uh, all these things of what you do. Um, we are in a height of pricing and demand and it's like a perfect storm of video game players, but you know, will it always be that way? I don't know. Uh, I, I really enjoyed watching the Not For Resale documentary and I highly recommend it. So, um, you know. Tell me to watch it. I haven't. Just, I, I keep forgetting every time and I want to watch it. I highly. just find it to be very interesting and I have, you know, I agree. I think that there will be mom and pop stores that will always maintain it as long as they put in the drive, effort, energy. And not saying the ones that don't make it don't do that. I'm not trying to say that in the slightest possible it's way hard. at all. It's a hard it, business. It, hard it, world. I agree. So... Um, Christopher Ryan asked, do you guys think any genre of games or series of games is actually in a bubble for its value? When he made this comment two months ago, I responded to him saying, no, not really. And right now I kind of feel Pokemon. Um, Pokemon, Pokemon. But Pokemon five years ago, four years, I can't remember now. Pokemon Go. Yeah. Drove. Pokemon games from $14.95, $9.95, $14.95 for gold, silver, crystal. Crystal was $20. Um, boxes were, box completes were $75, $100 if it was mint, and then Pokemon Go drove those prices up, you know, to the $50 and $60 mark in a hundred, box, actually it, it was just to play them, the box ones weren't selling for any more even then, but now Pokemon is just going crazy, they printed millions of copies of that game, yeah. it's just, that is in a huge bubble right now. You know, um, I'd be careful, be careful buying as a store, and <laughs> don't build up too much inventory because it will pop, it pop. It, well, I think it's the most risky thing right now. Oh, and I do, I just, tons of people want to buy Pokemon. Pokemon sells very fast. Pokemon's very popular, and I totally understand why everyone's buying it because they really like it and they really love it. Um, it surprises me how prices high the prices are for the amount that was produced. And I wouldn't want to buy a CIB Pokemon Blue at 300 bucks right now, personally. But that's just me. Um, I like to play with numbers a lot, and sometimes that can be really like, you gotta take all numbers that you play with with a grain of salt because numbers can be misconstrued or manipulated to your own agenda very, very easily. But I just did a fun thing where I took the amount of Pokemon Red and Blue that was produced. Um, and then I ran the math of what half of percent of that was produced. And if the concept was if half of 1% of Pokemon games of red and blue exist still sealed, how many would there be? And there'd be over 25,000 still sealed. <laughs> so just something to think about. One half of 1%. Well, half of 1%. Half, half a percent. Um, and again, when you look at population reports and stuff like that, 25,000 is not that much for some items, but it's just food for thought. Food for thought. Yep. And last thing, I guess, uh, I don't really have anything more on my paper. Well, uh, one more. I just love it, and I always have to bring it up. Does Chris have ticks, or is he just nervous on camera? Serious question. Relax, friend. Great vid. Uh, yes. Yes, I do have nervous ticks. You should nervous, see, you should not see so much. The, you should see the circle around the island from him just pacing around I, it I, during the day. I pace like crazy. Uh, the other thing I like to point out is by the time we do this videos, it is 30 minutes past the fact of when working a long, I'm long day from here since 10 a.m. and I got 45 minutes to go after I leave, so I'm usually just kind of tired and I'm really addicted to an MMO right now, so I don't sleep very much. <laughs> yeah. So. You know, but thank you for concerning yourself with my health. I'm totally okay. Yep. <laughs> so, if you made it to the end of the video, you know we asked to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. We really want—I mean, 25 people. Uh, we should hit that, please, 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 right so fast. And uh, we will give away nothing. We don't give away nothing. Yep. We have nothing to give away. Just our smiles. Yeah. Thanks for watching. You know, I appreciate you allowing us to. You know, 
throw a little sarcastic humor out there. Yeah, we, mean, we mean no harm to anybody. We actually, we love everybody. Go Metal Jesus Rocks, you know, like, great channel, lots of well, good yeah. content and video and everything like that. Um, it's great content, yeah. yeah everybody knows. Everything's good. Uh, we are just having some fun today, and that's where it yeah. was, so. Have a good one. Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys. You have Bye. a nice day. Unscripted content. Video card full!